All right, let's try a blue background here. Maybe you won't see it on the, I think you just see the, uh, the letters. F, 2 Corinthians 10, 5a. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Great story. T.A. McMahon. Here's the story. Brother, I'm not interested in any of your divisive doctrinal talk. All I care about is knowing that a person loves Jesus. Someone tells me that no matter what church he goes to, he's my brother in Christ. It didn't seem like the right time or place to get into an argument with this individual. Nevertheless, I felt compelled at least to get a question in before the conversation ended. When you talk with someone who tells you, you he loves Jesus, do you ever ask that person, Jesus who? <clears throat> I tend to do that now. But I try to tone it down a little bit as if you don't know who he is. After quick thought, the elderly gentleman let me know that he would never ask such a question. <clears throat> it wouldn't be loving, he said. So whenever I visit friends, he goes on to say, in Pennsylvania, there is a man whom I make it a point to see. He is a joy to be with, one of the friendliest men I know. Though a committed Muslim, he regards himself as an ecumenist. He's proud of the fact that he shares some of the beliefs of both Jews and Christians. Occasionally, he attends a Presbyterian church with my friends and truly enjoys the experience and their fellowship. Once in a restaurant, he was expressing to me and our Christian friends his love for Jesus. He ended his proclamation with these words, If I could tear away my flesh so that all of you could see deep into my heart, you would know how much I love Jesus. The emotions that filled his every word were stunning. It's uncommon to hear such a devout declaration, even in Christian circles. Getting back to my boysenberry pie, I felt good about my friend's expression of love when a nagging thought hit me. Jesus who? A brief mental skirmish took place over whether or not to ask such a question. My words, however, came out before my mind had settled the issue. Tell me about the Jesus you love. My Muslim friend didn't hesitate. He's the same one you love. Before I got doctrinal with my friend, I thought I should try to show him why it was important to make sure he, we were talking about the same name, the same Jesus. I used his neighbor, who was a great friend to both of us, as an example. He I, and I really loved the guy. After agreeing on our mutual feelings, I began to give a description of our common friend's physical attributes. He's five foot six, because he's completely bald. He weighs 320 pounds. He wears a ring in his left nostril. Actually, I didn't get quite get that far before objections were made. He said, wait a minute. He's easily over six foot four. I wish I had all his hair. And he's the thinnest man I know. My friend added that it was obvious that we weren't talking about the same person. Does it matter, I asked? He gave me an incredulous look. Of course it does. I don't have a neighbor fitting your description. You may know someone else like that, but it's not my good friend and neighbor. I pointed out that if I truly believed the description I'd just given, then we couldn't possibly be friends with the same person. He agreed. What followed was my description of the Jesus I know, knew. He was crucified and died on the cross for my sins. Did the Jesus you know do that? No, he said. Allah took him to heaven before the crucifixion. Judas died on the cross. Instead, the Jesus I know is God himself, who became a man, I said. Is that your Jesus? He shook his head. No, Allah alone is God. Jesus was a great prophet, but just a man. The discussion went on to many other characteristics the Bible ascribes to Jesus. In almost every case, my Muslim friend, Muslim friend had a different perspective. Though he remained convinced that he held the correct view, the fact that our contradictory convictions couldn't be reconciled, seemed to dampen his zeal for proclaiming his love for Jesus. Some may see my questioning as unloving, as proof of the divisiveness of arguing over doctrines. I see it as trying to clear the way for my friend to have a genuine relationship with the only true Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Not shall may he or other men have wittingly or unwittingly imagined or devised. Quite simply, doctrines are teachings. They are either true or false. A true doctrine can be divisive in a harmful way. That characteristic applies only to false teachings. Now I beseech you, brethren, <clears throat> mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Jesus, who is the truth, can only be known in truth and by those who seek the truth. Christ himself caused division, division between truth and error. Jesus, who is the pivotal of the question for every believer in Christ, we should first of all ask it of ourselves, teaching our own beliefs about Jesus. Misunderstanding about him inevitably become obstructions in our relationship with him. The question also may be vital in our fellowshipping with those who claim to be Christians. On a brief airline flight, I recently, a friend of mine was concerned enough to ask the person next to him some crucial questions about his relationship with Jesus. Although the young man professed to have seen, been a Christian for four years or so, and participated in Christian fellowship for professional athletes, he didn't really know Jesus, nor did he understand the gospel of salvation. My friend led him to the Lord before the plane landed. All too often, phrases similar to we stand together with anyone who names the name of Christ are emotionally charged coverings for ecumenical agendas, which differ. The fear of destroying unity plagues those who take seriously such unbiblical propaganda, even to the point of discouraging any vestige of interest in contending for the faith. Astonishingly, Christian unity now includes collaborating for the moral good of society with cults that name the name of Jesus. So the cults teachings about Jesus include every unscriptural idea imaginable. The Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for example, couldn't be further removed from the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus invented by Joseph Smith, and after whom be named his church, is the first spirit child of Elohim, just as all humans, angels, and demons are spirit children of Elohim. The Mormon Jesus became flesh through physical intercourse with Elohim, between Elohim, God the Father, who has a physical body, huh? and the Virgin Mary. Their Jesus is the half-brother of Lucifer. He came to earth to become a god. His sacrificial death gives immortality to every creature, including animals, at the resurrection. However, whether an individual creature spends an eternity in hell or in one of the three heavens is totally up to his or her or its performance. The Jesus Christ of the mind science cult, Christian science, religious science, unity school of Christianity, and so on, is no different from any other human being. Christ is a spiritual idea of God and not a person. Jesus neither suffered nor died for mankind's sins because sin doesn't exist. Rather, he helped humanity to cease from believing that sin and death have any reality. That is salvation in so-called Christian science. Jehovah's Witnesses also love Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. Before their Jesus was born on earth, he was Michael the Archangel. He is a God, not, but not Jehovah God. When their Jesus became a man, he ceased to be a God. There was no physical resurrection of the JW Jesus. Jehovah raised his spirit body, hid his physical remains, and now, once again, Jesus exists as an angel called Michael. The Bible promises that when a believer in our Lord and Savior dies, he and she or she immediately goes to be with Jesus. But with the Jesus, however, only 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses have that privilege, but not at death, for they are annihilated when they die. That is, they spend an indefinite period in an inactive and unconscious state, in effect ceasing to exist. My fellowship of love with the biblical Jesus, however, is unbroken and everlasting. Roman Catholics love Jesus. I did for quite some years of my life. But he was very different from the Jesus I know and love. Sometimes he was still a babe in the arms of a, or a young boy, overshadowed and protected by his mother. When I wanted his help, I made sure I prayed to his mother first. The Jesus to whom I pray now hasn't been a baby for almost 2,000 years. The Jesus I loved as a Catholic resided bodily in a small, 
box-like tabernacle on our church altar in the form of white, a white wafer, while simultaneously inhabiting millions of pieces of bread worldwide. My Jesus is the physically res resurrected Son of God. He doesn't indwell inanimate objects. The Roman Catholic Jesus I knew was the Christ of the sac crucifix, his body continually hanging on the cross, fittingly symbolic of the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass and his unfinished work of salvation. Nearly two millennia ago, the biblical Jesus fully paid the debt for my sins. He has no need of the seven sacraments, the liturgy, the priesthood, the papacy, his mother's intercession, indulgences, prayer to our and for the dead, purgatory, and so on, to help save anyone. Roman Catholics who say that they love Jesus, though they may call themselves charismatic Christians or Catholics, evangelical Catholics or born-again Catholics, actually love a Jesus who is not the biblical Jesus. He's another Jesus. Even some who claim to be evangelicals promote a different Jesus. The so-called faith and prosperity teachers promote a Jesus who is materially prosperous. <coughs> Accordingly, to, according to evangelist John Avazini, whose expensive wardrobe reflects his teachings, Jesus wore designer clothes, a reference to a seamless robe, similar to what kings and wealthy merchants wore. In a convoluted argument, success preacher Robert Tilton claims that being poor is a sin, and since Jesus was sinless, it follows that he must have had been extremely rich. Positive confession teachers, Fred Price, claims, explains that he drives a Rolls Royce simply because he's following the way of Jesus. Or Robert says that because Jesus and the disciples had a treasure, or Judas, they must have had plenty of money. So, in addition to preaching a Christ who was materially wealthy, many of the faith teachers, such as Kenneth Hagin, <coughs> Kenneth Copeland, so on, proclaim a Jesus who descended into hell and had to be tortured by Satan in order to complete the atonement for the sins of mankind. That's not the Jesus I know and love. And we have author Tony Campolo's Jesus indwells everyone. Television preacher Robert Schuller presents a Jesus who died on the cross to secure our self-esteem. In support of this Jesus, Christian psychologists and numerous evangelical preachers tell us that his death on the cross proves our infinite value to God and is the basis for our self-worth. Not only are a variety of ego-enhancing Jesuses being promoted today, but we're also being told by a psychologized church that the truth about Jesus may not be as important for our psychological well-being as our own perception of him. That's the basis for the current teaching by psycho-spiritual integrationist Neil Anderson and others who promote unbiblical inner healing techniques. We have to forgive Jesus for situations in the past where we feel he disappointed or wounded us emotionally. Jesus who? Fellowship with Jesus is the heart of Christianity. It's not something merely imagined, but is a reality. He literally indwells all who place their faith in him as Savior. The relationship we have with him is both subjective and objective. The genuine personal experiences with Jesus are always in harmony with his objective word. His spirit ministers his word to us. And that knowledge is the foundation for our fellowship with him. Our love for him is demonstrated by and increases through our obedience to what he commands. Our trust in him is strengthened through the knowledge of what he reveals about himself. Jesus said, Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. To whatever degree we believers entertain false beliefs about him, about Jesus, and his teachings, we undermine our vital relationship with him. Nothing can be better on this earth than the joy of fellowship with Jesus and with those who know and are known by him. On the other hand, nothing could be more tragic than the offering of one's affections to another Jesus, the invention of men and demons. Our Lord prophesied that many would fall prey to that great delusion just prior to his return. There will be many who, because of the alleged signs and wonders they perform in his name, will convince themselves that they know Jesus and are serving him. To them he will speak these sobering words, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Rather than being divisive 
asking the question, Jesus who, may be the most loving service one can perform these days. The answer